All right, so, hello. Uh, thank you for that introduction. So, we're going to do this sitting because I've been really sick yesterday, so I'm just going to keep it easy. Uh, so, um, here on the slides, you'll see a little bit more of what we get up to outside of our work. We just wanted to emphasize that uh, people doing this work in scholarly communications are actually a whole people outside of work as well. Um, and I want to start, as a kind of we start our presentations with territorial acknowledgements. I'd like to do that as well. Um, we work, study, and live in a region which overlaps with the unceded, traditional, and ancestral lands of the Slavitooth, Katsi, Kukitnam, Squamish, Kwantan, Musqueam, Semyam, Tawasan, and Kikai peoples. And Kwantan Baltic University where I work takes its name from the Kwantan First Nation. So we wanted to sort of frame this discussion about course journals and ways that they can support social justice by um, framing a little bit um, our, how we situate ourselves in this discussion and, and what we bring or what we don't bring to this conversation. Um, so Karen and I both wanted to acknowledge that we do bring a fair amount of our own privilege to this work. And uh, while we're working with, and in many cases, in some ways representing marginalized communities and individuals um, as we work with course journals in this context, um, we don't have the lived experience of that um, history of marginalization and oppression, which we'll be discussing today. So we wanted to make sure we sort of frame our conversation that way. Um, we're very much still learning about this topic, and we feel very fortunate <coughs> to have had the opportunity to work with faculty and students at our institutions and to learn from them as we explore this work. So I'll just give you a quick overview of what we're planning to discuss in the next 20 minutes. Um, so we wanted to start by sort of Situating um, ourselves as a community in the conversations and discussions that are happening around social justice in scholarly communications and in libraries. Um, then we are going to go through two case studies from um, each of our institutions um, of uh, journals that we work with in classrooms with course instructors. Um, we'll talk about some of the lessons that we've learned along the way working on these projects, some recommendations that we have for OJS and the ways that, they, that OJS can continue to support this work. And we wanted to acknowledge as well that the course journals that we will be presenting on today were designed and managed by the course instructors and their students. Um, so we worked on them um, as librarians, we supported these projects and the use of OJS, but we wanted to make sure we were giving credit to the instructors and the, and the students for the work that they did on this. Okay, so, um, so again, to sort of frame us in this conversation that's happening around um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, we took a look through some of the literature and some of the conversations that are happening in libraries and as well as um, and we're seeing this coming up more and more um, as a discussion point. So, um, for example, last year, the Library Publishing Coalition published the ethical framework for library publishing, and that includes sections on diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as accessibility and scholarly publishing. And we were fortunate as well to hear from Tara Robertson during her keynote yesterday around accessibility, diversity, and inclusion in hiring practice. So we're seeing more and more that this discussion is happening um, in the library community, at conferences, on listservs, and in academic writing, and the topics are very alive and relevant in scholarly communications today. So what does this then look like in a practical sense, and how can this like, respect of the scholarly publishing actually inform our teaching practices? Um, so what we want to do is guide students to an understanding for scholarly publishing and their role in contributing to the whole scholarly conversation as students and emerging scholars. And if we want to really be inclusive, this involves rejecting long-held notions of how scholarship is recognized and defined, and letting go of the notion of scholarly activity as unconnected to the rest of our lives and all the aspects of our existence as human beings. Um, as April Hathcock says in her blog post, Feminist Framework for Radical Knowledge Collaboration, uh, scholarship is not just an intellectual exercise. It involves human beings doing work with other human beings and subjects related to the lives of human beings. We bring our full embodied and intellectual selves to this work as we engage in different ways of knowing and unknowing. So now I scream. <laughs> And so at the same time as we're having this conversation with students in the classroom, we're encouraging them to think critically about the types of information um, that tend to be given a voice and recognition in our institutions and in scholarship. So we ask them to really think about whose voices are missing or underrepresented, who acts as the gatekeepers to decide what and who is worthy to participate in academic scholarship, 
and why is so much value placed on scholarship written in the English language? Um, so again, we have a quote from April Hathcock where she encourages, encourages us to use language as a tool for inclusion rather than a barrier to participation. And with these questions in mind, we can encourage students to challenge current publishing models and the inequities they can reproduce, and to work on building a more radically new and empowered system of knowledge creation and sharing. So then the role of librarians in all of this um, is that we often provide instruction around scholarly publishing practices and concepts such as copyright or author rights, open access and peer review. Um, but we can also work with course instructors to introduce these ethical considerations and inequities in traditional publishing models um, and how students can address these in their course journals. Um, of course, we also help with the technical aspects of OGS as well. No, it has a good learning curve and that can be a barrier for people to start doing these kind of assignments. Okay, so we're going to jump into the first case study that we have for you, which is a course journal that was run at Simon Fraser University in 2018. And um, in the interest of time, I will just show you some screenshots of what the journal looks like, but when we share the slides, we'll be able to look, have a look at the paper and, and take a look around if you're curious about it. So this course journal called Intersectional Apocalypse was produced by a third year class in SFU's Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies Department. And this was led by Dr. Ella Shabib. Shabib. Shibuwo. Shibuwo. Um, and Dr. Shibuwo works on inter intersectional approaches to digital publishing studies. So she brings a fair amount of knowledge and expertise to this area and to the class that she created. So I'm presenting this case study as an example of a course journal, again, supported by SFU Library, um, but the course and the, um, and the journal were produced by the class. So students in the class collectively designed and built this journal, making decisions around several important aspects. They paid special attention to imbalances of power in traditional scholarly publishing, and they were able to work out ways to reject, avoid, or mitigate many of these um, imbalances by making certain choices. So for example, um, they recruited submissions from the wider community uh, beyond their class, so students at their institution, but also the community outside of SFU. And they were looking in particular for different types and formats of work, so visual art, poetic prose, zines, um, advocating for different formats of scholarship and trying to hear from underrepresented and traditional, traditionally marginalized voices, moving beyond um, the traditional sort of written text or article. The course chose the class chose an open peer review um, form of peer review uh, in order to generate sort of an open dialogue and discussion between um, the folks who submitted the content and the students in the class who are conducting the peer review. They wanted to promote open, fair, and collaborative discussions between the author and the viewer. And they also made peer review optional, so anyone who wished to submit to the journal without going through that process was, was welcome to do that, and there would just be a note that the work hadn't been peer reviewed. They paid special attention to accessibility. Um, they, you can see on the side here, they had um, all of their submissions in HTML, which is screen readable, as well as accessible PDFs, and they also took the time to make MP3 audio recordings of all of the submissions. The class chose a Creative Commons attribution non-commercial license for their work after a lot of discussion about which license would work best for them. And they also used uh, or had the option for traditional knowledge labels um, for anyone in, who was a member of an Indigenous community who was submitting work that had different access requirements. So if they uh, wanted the work to only be accessible to certain communities at a certain time of year or any other locations, they provided that as an option um, that kind of gives more uh, flexibility than the Creative Commons licenses that are commonly used. Um, and they talked a lot about sustainability of their journal and what would become of it, um, how it would financially sustain itself. They were very keen to pursue a diamond open access model where there are no fees to subscribe, no fees to publish. Um, and they did consider placing a donation button on the homepage of the, of the journal as well for um, that sustainability. Yeah, so here I um, just have a couple of examples of the types of content that were published in the journal. So you can see some evidence of the class moving beyond traditionally text-based academic articles, using a mixed media approach and different types of storytelling to challenge the notion of what is considered academic content. <coughs> so now at Quantlin, um, we have here the Logan Creek Decolonization Project Journal, and this is run by Dr. Kathy Dunster and her students in multicultural culture. 
They document the ongoing botanical decolonization and re-indigenization of Logan Creek, which is an area on the Gate Lovely campus. Um, and their intention with this class is to develop biographies for significant food, medicinal, and technology plants that are used by the form of conversation, um, which can be then developed into signage for the site as well. So they can have an interpretive um, area there. Um, and they use names in the Hunkameenan dialect, which is spoken in the Lower Mainland by the Muskegon and the mouth of the Fraser River and operated with the form of conversation. Um, so the way this class works is that students write a, a peer-reviewed paper, but they are then collectively and openly peer-reviewed and edited. So they literally pass them around in hard copy um, and collect collectively edit them. Um, and the idea is that there's a uniform quality of language that is achieved, and that no one is left behind, even if they're international students who's, who, for English, might not be their first language. Um, so it's very collaborative uh, class in that way. So these papers include alternative forms of scholarship as well in the form, uh, for example, of recipes. There's a lot of recipes in here, and if you can't read that on the screen, it uh, has a recipe for blue elderberry syrup. Um, and so they also, there are also plans to, plans to include audio recordings of non-communal names, both online and potentially also outside in the area, um, that are preferably spoken by local local speakers of the language. Um, all work is openly available online with CC licenses, both to share the work the students work widely with the world, and also so that the quantum first nation itself has access to the materials. Um, Kathy works to develop that area of Logan Creek because it was taken from the Quantum First Nation and restored by construction. Um, and she just does this work until such time as there's a more formal agreement of land to so that the land or the whole land on campus is handed over back to them. Uh, our next issue uh, that's in the works at the moment will focus on documenting weeds, uh, and those will also include recipes because it has a lot of international students and what's considered a weed in, in, uh, in Canada might not actually be considered a weed in wherever they, they come from. Um, they've got some future plans for development where they increase the accessibility of the materials itself, those are at the moment not, not very accessible yet, and also that the potential to add to traditional knowledge labels um, so that people have to agree that it is for example, a particular season where they are particular group of people before they access the uh, um, um, materials. So we're going to jump in and talk a little bit about some of the lessons that we've learned from the library in supporting this project. Um, and Karen and I have both worked on a few different course drama projects, aside from the two that we discussed today. And uh, one thing that's always top of mind is the sustainability of the journal. What will happen beyond the, the end of the course? Um, so, for example, SFU was fortunate to have Dr. Shibuo as a Ruth Wynn Woodward postdoctoral fellow from 2017 to 2019. Um, but she's since moved on uh, to another position as an assistant professor at Illinois State University. So the future of the Intersectional Apocalypse Journal is currently uncertain. It remains to be seen if it will be taken up by another instructor, perhaps in the same department, um, or a team at SFU. Um, for now, it will be preserved by SFU Digital Publishing in its current format because it is um, a great showcase of the work that was done. Um, other course journals might continue to, to publish in subsequent iterations of the course if the instructor continues to teach. Um, they could transition to student journals as well, so um, it might be taken up by a student association or society who can continue to publish outside of a structured classroom environment. We also find uh, the OGS learning curve that we mentioned a little bit earlier uh, can be a challenge in the courses, especially when we're running uh, journals like this in a four-month uh, period with an instructor that hasn't used the software before. Um, so we do work on some of the instructional aspects of supporting the instructor and supporting the um, students in the class, taking them through the workflow of um, submitting their work, handling the peer review, and copy editing, and so on. Um, and you'll notice in, um, in the SFU example, uh, the main portion of the course was really about taking students through the production of the journal and setting it up in OJS, as well as going through that publishing process. Um, we do find in a four-month term that that's a huge learning curve. It's much more straightforward for the students to be publishing their own work in a journal that's already established and set up for them, uh, rather than having to handle both um, sort of the creation of the journal and the publishing process. So reusing course journals in subsequent courses is one way to reduce this workload in the future. And so finally, time and resources um, are key to this. I alluded to that with the, the fact that we're running these in four-month terms. Um, but many of the structures are very dedicated to the quality of the, of the final product. 
Um, and they might take on the large task of editing all of the submissions, all of the, the work that goes into the journal. So one of the instructors in our examples estimated that they spent about 200 hours of work um, in, in producing the final output. Um, so for this reason, we recommend that the journals publish just one submission per student in the term. Um, we're trying to take on too many projects at once can be too much in a short time frame. Um, and we recommend that, um, that the instructor focus the class either around writing and publishing for the journal or designing and setting up the journal, but not both. You know, we'd like to um, to end this with um, some recommendations for OJS. And we know that some of these might just we don't actually know how they will be implemented, but they're just recommendations from uh, feedback that we've had. So the course journal examples that we, we've given um, already show the many capabilities of OGS and bringing about kind of these changes for only publishing and giving people those options to, to engage in alternative forms of scholarship. Um, but we also think that there are some opportunities to adapt to changes in scholarly publishing that reflect efforts to bring more equity and inclusivity into the process. So one of the um, requests that we've had was more options for open peer review uh, that could be added to allow for public discussion around the work instead of anonymous or double anonymous models. Um, and then more in sort of a blog style, so more in uh, discussion about it openly, more so than the open peer review option that's already in the included in the um, The other recommendation we have would be to somehow install some kind of triple anonymous uh, where the author is unknown to the journal editor, which could decrease bias in the initial decision-making process before submissions are sent to peer review. I have no idea what this is um, <laughs> and The other thing is an option for a donate button to be added to the homepage um, to provide an alternative business model for that in OA journals. And I know that there is some option for that, but have that standard available is just one of the options uh, out of the box you can create. Um, and then lastly, um, more nuanced access options for traditional knowledge. For example, that the user must indicate that they belong to a particular community or demographic, and acknowledge that the content has specific access limitations before accessing a particular piece of content. And of course, it's on the system, the same split when you're about 18 and you want to uh, look at that, that from the website or something. Yeah, so to close, we have um, a few resources here um, sort of about uh, course journals as well as the student journal toolkit that was recently added to the, doc the documentation hub. And I just wanted to, again, extend a thank you to the instructors and the students that we were able to work with on this project.